All of us here have something important in common. We all have a connection to nonprofit organizations. We may know them as environmental organizations, neighborhood associations, unions, professional societies, arts groups. And we all know people that have benefited from the work of nonprofit organizations. We may recognize them by name. The Boys and Girls Club, the United Community Center, the YWCA, and many others. How are we connected to them? We're connected to them as volunteers, as staff, as board leaders, as neighborhood leaders, as donors. Some of us receive services from nonprofits, and some of us participate in their many programs. So what brings me here today? A passion for social justice inherited from my family. For me, it starts with my immigrant grandparents. Their experience of grinding poverty in southern Italy led them to America a century ago. Their stories made an early mark and planted in me a deep yearning for justice. My father was a construction worker, union leader, and community volunteer. And for dad, family came first. He was always there for us. He was a great example for me of father, volunteer, and activist. My passion for social justice has led me to work in the nonprofit sector for the last 50 years as a community organizer, a volunteer, a board leader, a staff director, sometimes a donor, and as a trainer and consultant to nonprofit organizations. And during this time, I've worked with some amazing, dedicated people involved in nonprofits. In our community, nonprofits provide food to hungry people, shelter for the homeless, job training for the unemployed, shelter for abused children, health care for the uninsured, and after-school programs for young people, and so much more. And from my 50 years of involvement, I can tell you this city of ours would be unlivable without nonprofits and the hard work they do. But here's troubling news. Even with all of these groups hard at work, our city remains unlivable for thousands of Milwaukeeans. Why is this so? Our city sets records of the wrong kind. Often when a new study comes out, Milwaukee is at or close to the bottom of the pack on key indicators. And how bad is it? The seventh worst economically distressed large city. Some of the lowest reading and math proficiency scores in the country. In Milwaukee County, the worst incarceration rate for black men. The most segregated metro area and a black poverty rate of 40%. Why aren't we making more progress after all of this hard work? Well, for one thing, we have a local economy built on the assumption that thousands of Milwaukeeans can be paid substandard wages that trap them and their children 
in permanent poverty. We offer programs to alleviate the pain for some individuals, but widespread poverty persists. That's because, as a community, we've failed to tackle underlying root causes. The economic, the social, and the political systems that produce high levels of poverty. Equally important is racism directed toward black Milwaukeeans and other communities of color. Racism embedded in our country since its founding has been a defining feature of Milwaukee. We provide service to some individuals affected by racism, but racism at the deeper systems level remains, giving rise to disparities in every sector of community life. If things are going to really change, we need to shift direction from modest service goals that provide temporary relief for some to bold, courageous actions that challenge and change the underlying political, social, and economic systems. For the shift to occur, nonprofits need to reassess their work, especially those organizations working in low-income communities. While it's important to provide services to individuals, we know that this is not enough. It's essential, and it must continue. But why aren't we directing more of our effort at changing the underlying systems? What's holding us back? First, funding is often more available for providing direct services to individuals. The results come faster, and they're easier to see and document. There's also strong resistance to change. While the status quo has been pretty bad for the many, it's been pretty good for the powerful few, and they use their power to impede and prevent change. For example, promoting restrictions on voting and opposing minimum wage increases. And there's something else going on. It's our dependency on quick fixes or symptomatic solutions to problems. It looks something like this. It starts with a problem. There are two possible solutions. The first is the symptomatic solution. It's appealing because it's easier to implement and it's cheaper, at least in the short run. And it's called a symptomatic solution for a reason. It's focused on the symptoms of problems. The second solution, the fundamental solution, is aimed at the underlying systems and structures that are producing the problems in the first place. Fundamental solutions require a deep understanding of programs. They're harder to implement. And sometimes they require a large commitment of resources. But here's the thing. When we use a symptomatic solution, some of the symptoms go away for a while. And it takes the pressure off of us to implement the fundamental solution. Here are two examples. The problem of homelessness. The symptomatic solution, emergency housing for homeless people. The fundamental solution, living wage family supporting jobs and access to high quality mental health services. The problem of hunger. The symptomatic solution, food pantries and meal programs. The fundamental solution, again, more family supporting living wage jobs. 
What's been the result of this? Well, the temporary fix has become our permanent community response. Emergency housing for the homeless, emergency food for hungry people have become permanent emergency systems. And they lead us to believe that social conditions that are completely unacceptable are somehow a new normal, that there will always be lots of hungry people, and that it's normal for there not to be enough safe, clean housing that is affordable. And again, when we implement these symptomatic solutions, it takes the pressure off of us to solve these problems once and for all. So what do we do? We need to keep on serving people that are in desperate need. There's no question about that. And there are so many people in desperate need that some nonprofits have to concentrate on emergency services. And this is all good. But it's just not good enough. At the same time, we continue to provide services to individuals. We must now reposition the community-based nonprofit sector as a powerful force for social change at the underlying systems level. Of course, nonprofits are not solely responsible for solving all of our community's problems, but they have a crucial role to play in changing underlying systems. For one thing, they've been, provided, they've been providing vital services to communities in need for a long time. And as a result, many of these nonprofits have unparalleled reach into low-income communities. They have deep relationships of trust with countless community leaders and residents. And many of these nonprofits understand the systemic barriers to change, even if they haven't addressed them sufficiently in the past. So for nonprofits that want to move in this direction, how does the journey begin? For starters, more nonprofits need to pinpoint the root causes of the problems they seek to address. Root causes are below the surface and often hard to reach, hard to uncover. But we're familiar with the concept. All of us have heard somebody say, it's only the tip of the iceberg, suggesting that there's a lot more going on below the surface. And we know that trees on our streets, in our parks, in our backyards, have large root systems below the ground, and that trees wouldn't exist otherwise. So how do we uncover root causes? We get to root causes by repeatedly asking the question, why is this happening? Here's an example. One persistent problem is the low high school dropout rate among low-income students. We ask ourselves, why is this happening? Youth making bad choices, schools can't keep students interested, some students wanting and sometimes needing to work instead of studying. Why is this happening? Disenfranchised communities, and schools that are under-resourced. Why is this happening? A lack, of, a lack of equitable funding and accountability in school systems that serve the children of poor people. And why is this happening? Poor communities lack political power. Armed with a deeper understanding 
of root causes, nonprofits can begin to consider additional roles to play. And I'd like to tell you about four strategies. First, nonprofits can take a fresh look at the programs and services they currently offer. They can redesign and, in some cases, start new programs that get closer to the root causes of problems. They can enter into new partnerships with organizations that are already working at the root. And another way they can uncover and get to root causes is by linking community problems to other systems. A really good example is reframing the growing problem of gun violence as a public health issue. The second way nonprofits can get closer to the underlying systems, to the root causes, is through advocacy and lobbying. Sometimes in our search for root causes, we discover that there are laws, regulations, and policies that hurt the people we serve. We can then take action through advocacy to change or eliminate those laws, regulations, or policies. And nonprofits have a long, rich history of advocacy on key issues, civil rights, gender equity, and others. We need to do more of this, much more. A third way nonprofits can get to the underlying systems is through nonpartisan voter registration and education at the neighborhood level. Nonprofits in Milwaukee have regular ongoing contact with thousands of people. Many of them are eligible to vote, but they're not registered yet. Nonprofits can turn these thousands into educated and engaged voters. The result of this will be sustained increases in voting, especially among younger voters and voters with a history of lower participation. And if this begins to happen, will this change things for the better? The fourth way nonprofits can reposition themselves as forces for systems change is by connecting to issue campaigns that are already underway. For example, by supporting efforts to expand and improve public transportation that gets unemployed people to jobs. By connecting to living wage campaigns like the fight for $15 and by connecting to organizations like Black Lives Matter and other initiatives that are tackling root causes at the lower level. And for each of these four strategies, there are organizations that are ready to help nonprofits move more of their impact to the root cause level. So, How do we reposition the community-based nonprofit sector as a powerful force for systems change? First, who's going to do it? We're going to do it. We're going to do it as leaders in nonprofits. We'll take action to spread this idea as volunteers, as donors, as staff, as board leaders, as neighborhood leaders. So how will we do this? According to Peter Block, a community builder, author, and activist, the answer to how will we do this is a resounding yes. Yes, we will do this. Yes, we can do this. Yes, we must do this together. Thank you.